so uh, yeah, um, let's get started. Thank everybody for um, for joining us. Um, yeah, we could see, or I could see there are a lot of people from across the globe. So uh, it's a good morning to some of you, some of you good afternoon, some of you good evening, um, wherever you're from. And in today's webinar, we'll be covering uh, data management um, in Salesforce uh, for the sports and entertainment industry. And we'll be talking about uh, yeah, data quality management for uh, uh, and the reasons why it's so important to have good quality data. Uh, and we have a very special guest today, so uh, more on that soon. Um, yeah, first, maybe it's good to start with uh, a round of introductions uh, on today's guests and, and the hosts. Afterwards, we're going to talk about uh, yeah, how Chicago Fire, uh, our, our guests, what they experienced, what the challenge initially was, and how they resolved some of their issues. And in general, we'll just talk about the business case and, of course, um, about the data. And in the end, we'll do a Q&A, so feel free to send over questions you might have in the Zoom control panel. And we'll try to give you an answer as many as possible. Altogether, it will take around 35 to 45 minutes in total, uh, depending on how long uh, the Q&A uh, is. So introductions. Um, as I said before, today's guest is uh, Hart Swingleberg. He's the Senior Manager of Business Intelligence uh, at Chicago Fire. So uh, Hart, could you introduce yourself? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, Obviously, we are coming from Chicago, so it is first thing in the morning for us. Um, but glad to be here. Um, a background, quick background on myself. Um, uh, as Ogi, Ogi mentioned, I am the senior manager of business intelligence. Um, the scope of our department takes on a number of different things: uh, data science, data engineering, uh, data privacy, data security, um, as well as CRM. So, a lot of different. Um, things we dive in and out of. Uh, the topic we're going to be covering today is very close to us. Um, it's been kind of brought in-house more internally, and we've started to build our team in and around Salesforce and other technology. So um, very happy to talk about the topic today and uh, the partnership we, we've had with uh, Plotty. Cool. Great. Thanks a lot, Hart. I know we've spoken a couple of times now, but it's always a pleasure uh, talking to you. Um, all right, well, let me introduce myself then. My name is Ogi Babic. I'm the account executive at Plauti. Um, and to the right of me is Ruben van der Kamp. He's the product owner. Um, and he'll be conducting in the most part of the, the Q&A. Let me see if Ruben can come off mute so he can introduce himself. Ah, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey guys, uh, my name is Ruben, I'm the product owner for Plauti. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that might arise uh, during the presentation, so uh, I'll be standing by to, uh, to answer anything uh, that comes up. Awesome. Thanks for that, Ruben. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, first, we'd like to start for the, the companies or clients or, or attendees that don't know us yet. Um, Plauti is the company behind Duplicate Check and Record Validation. And we're a Salesforce ISV partner that develops uh, data quality solutions exclusively for the Salesforce platform. Um, founded in 2011, we have around 1,500 clients and counting, are pretty high rated on the app exchange and with a top 20 position uh, on both of our apps, Duplicate Check and Rec Foundation. And Duplicate Check is the number one ranking data quality app on the app exchange. Um, as I mentioned, we offer two products right now, uh, Duplicate Check and Rec Foundation. Um, Duplicate Check deduplicates data in Salesforce uh, and RV validates the records um, such as like phone numbers, emails, physical addresses, and those sort of fields. And these apps can work uh, as standalone solutions, um, but they can also be very good integrated into each other. And there are several use cases where they are combined and make for a very, very good uh, combination. So the goal here uh, for us is to uh, offer solutions that can help to deduplicate and validate the data. Um, we have a wide range of clients um, from smaller local charities, nonprofits, up to larger organizations you've probably heard of. Um, think of Sony and uh, Chicago Fire, of course, but also the Nets, uh, Orlando City, Harvard, Johnson & Johnson. Um, you can see them all on the screen. And uh, these are some of the names we're, we're very proud of. And in today's topic, um, we're going to go over the business case of Chicago Fire. A couple of things we're going to talk about is um, how the data is structured for them. So uh, what integrations they use, uh, what the data flow is, uh, who the end users are, what they do with the data. And we're going to talk 
taking a, like a time machine back to the situation before Chicago Fire implemented some of our applications, uh, some of the challenges they faced. And we're also going to discuss what invalid board data um, has on the business. Furthermore, um, we're going to talk about some consequences of keeping everything as it actually was. Um, and also, we're also interested to know um, if there are any similarity between other sports clubs and entertainment industries in terms of data quality issues or challenges they, um, they face. So I think it's good to start with the more of a broader uh, question. And that is, um, Hart, if you could tell us a little bit more about how the data is actually structured. And I got the slides um, so I could show that as well. Yeah, definitely. If you want to go ahead and show that just to give them something to, to yeah. see rather than just staring at me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so this is this is what it looks like today. Obviously, this is an evolution of multiple years. Um, but to, to take it back and really set the stage for how we got here, um, you know, business intelligence, data science is relatively young still, um, especially in sports. Um, you know, if you took it back just five years, there was a lot of organizations. Uh, even in the well-known clubs uh, around the world that hadn't really invested in, in this area. Um, they've obviously had sales as long as time. They've, they've had service. Um, partnerships is relatively new as well. But um, the data science and BI space is relatively young still. And so for us as a club, you know, there was a lot of vendors that we were paying, vendors that almost were charging us to access our own data. Um, and so that that is kind of, you know, the club took a proactive approach about five, five, six years ago to want to bring it in house, want to organize it in house um, and work with the right partners and the right vendors to make that happen. Um, obviously, uh, MLS as a whole, as a league, identified Salesforce as a single solution for the entire league and uh, the clubs in which uh, operate in that league. So, um, you know, Salesforce became a quick um, pillar of, uh, of ours. Um, and so once we we started to build out that image and build out that picture, it took about six to 12 months to just to get a blueprint of what we wanted. Um, and we're now three years down that line. And, and this is what you're seeing three to four years later. Um, the important thing to really look at here is a lot of this is now owned, connected and operated by ourselves internally. So we're not looking to have a middleman pass us our data from our other systems. We're now hiring for staff to be able to help us do that or realigning ourselves with vendors who can do that more efficiently and in lower cost. Um, so what you're seeing is all of the data sources here on the left hand side, a lot of different sources. As a, as a football club, um, we have an academy system, we have adult rec league soccer, we have a foundation, um, and we also have the sales, service, partnerships, finance, everything you might expect from a normal business we have to be able to consolidate that into one central repository. So um, common, common these days uh, in the LT or ETL tool to get it there um, in, a, in a more efficient, um, faster, more frequent way to get it into our data warehouse. Now, once it's there, um, that's great. We've now got it in our own MDM tool, our own master data management tool where we can now take control of that. That then feeds into our business analytics tools, some of which you're probably familiar with. Um, you know, we also have in-house tools that uh, differentiate ourselves um, as, as team members on that on the business intelligence group. But lastly, is, and most importantly, is how do we deliver that, those data, those insights, those, that analysis, those different fields we're creating or transposing or whatnot, how do we feed that into these end user tools? Well, Salesforce being one of those and one of the most important, um, how do we get it there and have them buy in, adopt, use, leverage, et cetera, for their own purposes. And, and this is where kind of the rubber met the road about a year ago and where we, we met up with Plossy is all of those different sources have their own unique IDs, right? All of those unique IDs can be consolidated using golden <clears throat> record logic into its own kind of data warehouse ID. But still, even then, Salesforce users are still entering in duplicate contacts, or um, there's even our marketing cloud system, which you see up down below is also connected to our Salesforce system. So you have other entrants outside of our data warehouse that are feeding directly into Salesforce. Now we have to be able to quickly dedupe those and clean those up for our, our internal staff. 
our internal staff need to be able to know that this is the unique profile. This is the unique contact. This is the golden record for all intents and purposes of each of our contacts. Um, and when you're talking about over a million fans in our warehouse, right? And any given on any given day, somebody being able to feel confident about that person being who we say they are, and there's not another contact in our database with other pieces of information or other pieces of their profile, we need our, our internal staff to feel confident that they're going externally with the right information. And so we'll talk about it on the next few slides about um, you know, the improvements and, and what we've been able to do. But just to set the stage, we, we decided to bring everything internally. So we decided to remove the need and, and kind of um, separate ourselves from kind of external vendors who almost charged us for our own data and managing our own data when we wanted to be the ones to do that. Yeah, so, so it sounds like you take, took a more of a, um, what to call it, like, a, a, I'm not sure how to call it in English, but more of a pro approach like we're, we can do this ourselves. Um, we can see that other um, uh, vendors are actually charging us a lead for that data. So why not bring it all in? Um, one question I did had, have was, who are the end users then here? Because I can see um, a note tableau that's like a, I think you can visualize mm -hmm. data with that, but who, who's working with this data in, in general? Yes, a lot of groups. So <clears throat> obviously that's, it first started with sales and service in mind in, in partnerships. So um, those are kind of the revenue drivers of our organization and making sure that um, you know, they have the tools and the information uh, again, necessary to do their job efficiently, right? At, at the end of every year, we're judged by our revenue um, and services um, is also part of that in terms of retention. Yeah. Um, and at, at this point now, it also includes groups like our foundation. Um, it includes groups like our finance team. Um, so they're not necessarily the first line of sight, insight, um, but we are working to onboard them onto Salesforce as well, where this information will be ever more critical. Yeah. So the more people that join in to be like an end user, the more important it gets to have that, that good quality of data because there's so many, I think, yeah, I'm not, I haven't counted them, but all of, are there like, this is what you provided us, but are there even more integrations right now or like that you're adding in? Um, or is this pretty relevant, uh, pretty um, new? There are, yeah. I mean, when you can think about, uh, we, this is the business side, the sporting yeah as well um, becomes uh, important to really get the whole business. Um, those aren't really customer facing or that's not really customer centric, but uh, our football analytics is obviously something we'd, le we'd love to get into here as well. Um, and then, you know, outside of that, there's always new sources, right? Um, MLS is a, is a very big feeder of our data. Um, you know, about 40% of the records we capture come from the league level and then uh, business rules dictate those get assigned to our club and they're within our area in the, yeah. in the United States. So, um, yeah, I mean, just some of those ones on the bottom, EMLS is relatively new, right? So, uh, e-gaming is emerging, um, all around. I mean, there there's, we have a paid EMLS player, so that's becoming a, a an outlet for us. Um, some of this, uh, this gaming, right on gaming on the mobile app while you're in the stadium, you can play this game and, um, yeah. that data comes in. So, and then obviously FIFA has always been around, but it's it's been um, more important that information, the number of uh, just casual sports fans starting to play yeah. uh, EA Sports FIFA. So yeah, there's definitely more and more. Um, and as an organization, you know, we're trying to grow our presence in a, in a really busy marketplace like Chicago. So a lot of big sports teams in our in our area, and, and how do we compete with them? Um, yeah. How do we you know find different neighborhoods? And and so grassroots marketing is will be important and that kind of manifests itself on this deck uh, as those CSVs and Excels over there, those ad hoc um, ones. Yeah, got it. Yeah, um, indeed, sounds like a, like a, you know, we pretty good figured out like the, the data flow, uh, but before, but also, but, but yeah, um, you did come to us with a reason, of course. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the data challenges you faced before um, um, reaching out to us and then, so what was the reason and what kind of challenges did you have? Yeah, so we, we do have a golden record logic <clears throat> within our warehouse, but it only gets you so far. And actually we do it in conjunction with the MLS. So MLS helps us 
look at our kind of 1.2 million fans and says, you know, this person looks eerily close to this person. They seem to be the same person. Well, at the end of the day, what we found is we did a really deep dive into the golden record logic of the MLS. It's really good for MLS, right? It benefits the league, our league, who is really digitally focused. They don't have events. They, they, the way they interact with you is on the mobile app, right? Um, perhaps um, they're interacting with you on their website. Um, so they're really, really, their focus is digital. Whereas ours, we interact with you on, in digital, on our website, in, in stadium, right? At events. So we're not just interacting with you online. We're interacting with you in person. Yeah. And so the, the key here was it wasn't good enough. Um, the golden record logic from the MLS just wasn't good enough. It was good enough for the league and it benefited us. It got us probably 20% there, but there was a long way to go to feel confident that our records were completely you know, solely unique. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we found, um, in fact, we were talking with another MLS team about this same concept of, you know, it only going so far and, and they had recommended um, uh, to check the app on the app store and, and get the free trial, um, which we did. And, but really what it ended up being is the Salesforce duplicate rules only get you again, so far, they're really, they're really basic. They're looking across field to field, right? Email to email, first name and last name, the first name and last name, and some combinations of those. Um, yeah. So when you're just looking across, you're not looking from email one to email two, right? Or, e or like the marketing email to the ticketing email. You're only yeah. looking across and you'll never find all of the duplicates. Yeah. So we realized we needed more complex code and more comple complex logic um, from a trusted partner who could, you know, actually identify and not only, you know, flag them for us, but we don't want to manually have to do that, right? If you're talking about 1.2 million records and we're just, let's just assume, you know, for a second, like 10,000 of those are duplicates. It's not good enough to say, okay, we found them. And now here you go, go ahead and, and deduplicate them yourself within Salesforce. Yeah. We need to be able to automate those. So whenever a new record comes in, it's flagged as a duplicate, it's quickly suppressed. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what we've been able to do. But that was the whole issue is MLS was digitally minded. Salesforce um, duplicate only is able to identify. Yeah. And then it really looks across rows and not, you know, diagonally, yeah. diagonally across. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So that, that brings me more to the, to the next question as well. Um, so, and when did you when did you realize that there was like a challenge with data to be solved? Like, um, it, can you give me an example of maybe a department that, that came to you and said, well, hard, this really has to change. Like, did you have these type of conversations with them, people in, in, the, in, the, in the organization in terms of data quality or, or the, the poorness of the data or maybe not even poor, but um, in general, like that stuff had to change? Yeah, this one, this one brings up a lot of memories, a lot of, a lot of stories that I could fill this <laughs> with. Um, yeah, so uh, the role of our department is obviously to connect the entire organization. And so you saw on that first graphic, you know, you know, before I started, there was probably maybe four or five of those that any one department could see or visualize or even have insight into. When we started really bringing the entire organization into one system, one data feed, now you're talking about, you know, many different versions of heart entering our warehouse and, and needing to be combined into one. So <clears throat> when we just had the MLS rules running and then we still slowly moved into Salesforce and started taking advantage of their duplicate identification, we had no, a number of different departments saying, you know, hey, this, this season ticket holder is telling me you emailed them four times, five times. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm having, I'm seeing, you know, somebody being sold to, but they're already being serviced. They're already a current ticket holder or they're already a current partner of. Yeah. So we're seeing just, just um, communication flying from all across the club to, to the same person on different contacts, right? Um, with different opportunities, some being selling a partnership, some being trying to sell them tickets, some being trying to get them to attend an event. And what we were just saying is it's not, it wasn't good enough. It wasn't, there was no easy answer on my part to say, yes, I understand. I know what you're going through. Um, there just wasn't, that's not good enough. That doesn't, it doesn't sound good when people are hearing that you yeah. know it's an issue, but you can't easily fix it. Yeah. Um, really, it's a really, 
you know, when you break it down, it's a really simplistic topic, right? And, and the product you have is um, really answers something very easy to understand, right? Easy to, to, um, to think about. But on, when you actually dig into it, it's a very complex, very like, um, you have to get it right. Like you can't merge together the wrong contacts and you surely don't want to leave two separate yeah. uh, as I just described. So number of different apartments, like I said, I mean, we had multiple sales opportunities at some points and some be people being sold after having already been sold, you know, weeks and months prior. Um, so just conflicting messages across the club that, that, that didn't fly when, when you think of senior leadership and, you know, yeah. the message we want to have in the marketplace. Um, we want to be able to have just a unique, you know, one line of communication. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know you mentioned before, um, we had a couple of couple of calls, a couple of talks about this, that um, the goal of the organization is not like the MLS to feed data in and they, they don't really mind that much if the data comes in duplicate because it's just good for the brand, for the MLS uh, brand. Uh, but because you were serving um, fans who come into the stadium, they see you physically, they, they, they conversate with you, that it's, that it's much more important to have that single customer or 360 customer view or fan view actually. Um, it, how has this changed in, in, uh, with COVID? Like stadiums were closed for, for quite a long time. Like how, like how much more important did that communication get because you didn't see them or has it not changed? No, it, it's changed a lot. And, and now that we, you know, here in the United States, we're having, you know, a, a smaller amount of fans come back. Um, so, uh, but yeah, throughout the pandemic, it was, it was very important, right? The messaging that we were sending, um, you know, had to reach the right person, right? And it was, whether it was a retention of, hey, keep your money on account with us throughout the pandemic, um, you know, we'll honor that for our 2021 season or 2022 season. So being able to defer uh, their previous payments, um, even just around safety and security, right? Like, you know, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of different cities going back at different times, right? I know in the EU, it's, you know, everybody's pretty much on the same page. In the United States, you have some, some markets uh, going back earlier. Chicago is more of a pro, you know, more of a safe, we're kind of on the safer end of things. And, yeah. you know, that, that's just in order to ease the, the nerves of our fans about what we plan to do says a lot about our organization, right? And um, I, I know, you know, again, being on the other side of the pond, you probably saw a lot of the Black Lives Matter and all these these different things that occurred throughout the pandemic, you know, it being in a big city, those same things happen in, in here in town and um, just having a, the stance, right? And being able to communicate that in the right way to the right person, especially at the right time, right? Yeah. And having, it, it feels, you know, it does, it feels soft. It lands, it doesn't land right when you send the same email to somebody or send the same message through three different people, right? Yeah. Want to know that you have your one person at the club or your one department at the club that really has your back, understands your situation, uh, your wants, your needs. And so the pandemic was was very tough for us. A lot of different, uh, a lot of different. Um, yes, sorry. It's my yeah. computer just, <laughs> it just it did, his, did his own thing. He's like, well, let's stop the sharing. I'm like, no, we're not going to stop the sharing. We're just in the flow. All right, I think we're almost back. So sorry for that. It's that was weird. Um, yeah. So you, you were saying um, because of the time and, and at the right timing to kind of reach out to these people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Everybody just wanted, you know, everybody had their own thoughts and opinions during this pandemic, right? And, yeah. And everybody's gone through it in different ways, even though we want to pretend that it's all been the same for all of us, right? And so. As a club, we, we almost overemphasize the importance of that communication and that, you know, feeling yeah. of secure, security. And um, yeah, this, you know, for us, this was a very important product to, to you know, minimize, you know, multiple outlets of communication that yeah. have conflicting messages to our fans. Yeah. Perfect segue into the next uh, question. It's like we re rehearsed it. <laughs> but um, you, I know you mentioned before that, um, and that's in a, in a, I think that's a call which you had with one of our, one of my clients, Tim, or colleagues, Tim, not clients, is yeah. that you mentioned the sales and marketing departments were also kind of struggling with that communication. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about like um, 
I remember you, I've, I've, I've seen us written in a report that we did with Tim on um, the, that salespeople <clears throat> were having anxiety when calling the, their, their fans because they didn't have enough information. Like, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on, on how that was like and what, what their experience was? Yeah. <clears throat> so when you, when you looked at that, that previous graphic, you obviously you saw the number of sources there. If, if, those, if that information lives on multiple contacts, right, multiple records, um, not even just contacts, right, accounts too. So think about, um, you know, businesses, like our, our approach to par uh, partnership prospects and um, premium prospects. So if you're talking about accounts, you're talking about contacts, um, and you're also talking about the opportunities by which we can sell or service them. Yeah. Yeah, if, if those are disparate and that you have multiple records within any of those different objects, you're talking about different pieces of information also living there. And so yeah. some person might be selling one person with only a third of the picture in mind and another might be seeing the other third and, and doing a different, taking a different action uh, yeah. with that person. So the whole picture wasn't together. And, and I won't sit here and pretend our, our, we have a customer 360 because there's a lot we still wanna do to know about our fans and things we wanna ask and things we wanna understand. But the, let's call it the 80% we do know um, about our fans, I guess it translates to like 270, the 270 degrees insight we have on our fans, if those are broken out across different records, you're now seeing even less and less and less, and therefore you're not effectively yeah. interacting with them in the right way. So yes, our fan, like our, our sales reps, our service reps, our partnership team, our marketing team, if they know that they know more about this person than what they see by their eye, they're not going to trust it. And so they're yeah. saying, oh, okay, great. You know, 30% about these fans, you know, very little about these fans. I know more than you. Why, why do, should I trust this? Why should I you yeah. know, look at this context? But when you bring it all into one record, right? And now, they, now we're showing them more insights and, and they can validate those in real time <clears throat> while they're on the phone or while they're an inbound phone call is coming in. Yeah. They can now trust that we're capturing information on their behalf for them to leverage in their opportunities. Yeah. yeah, that really, I mean, I, I was in the in the automotive industry and we were also selling cars to, to like automotive dealerships and stuff. Um, and, and I know it's kind of awkward to call the same client every week because you have to make the sales, you have to make the, you have to sell the, the cars, but you can't keep talking about the same subject every week. Uh, and if there's not enough data to see like what to talk about, then yeah, I can really kind of, imagine how those sales reps are, are feeling um, because it doesn't really make the job more fun if you are on the phone on the, on, with, with the client or with the, with, the, with the fan and just keep asking the same questions every week, like have you bought tickets already or whatever. So yeah, I can really resonate with, the, with that mindset uh, that they have. And uh, it's good that you kind of try to, keep, try to bring it to 360. Maybe it's 270 now, but maybe in the future you could kind of bring it back to, uh, to the 360 goal. Uh, or yeah, let me, um, I have a couple yeah. So I, we all were also interested or audience probably interested, like what would have been the consequence consequence of keeping the data as it was, you know, you mentioned that, um, um, there's, uh, communication is, is harder, but what if you didn't change this subject last year or, or this topic, would things have changed? I, I think or, there, <clears throat> there, you know, the change was always going to happen. Um, on our team and yeah. uh, you know a lot of you know it's most organizations are starting to become more analytically focused and analytically conscious um, but you can't expect everybody right you have a lot of um, let's call it tenured employees who this is still a new thing they're trying to understand and learn and, and yeah interact. so um, the consequences you know we were always going to have to find a solution so so that was kind of bar none we had to find a solution but the consequences, I mean, we were seeing those because of just, we had connected the, all of the entire picture. So sources to warehouse to end user tools, end user tools, not just being our, our front lines of sales and service, but also of marketing, right? Yeah. And also in, in reporting for financials. And so when you're seeing duplicate things, you might be counting things twice or sending things twice. And like I said, in marketing, you know, if, if there's somebody who is already a ticket buyer and then now you have another record where they're not flagged as such, 
they're now may potentially be receiving promotions as well yeah. as, um, you know, let's call it a game day primer. And so they're a little confused as to, hey, you asked me to buy tickets, but I already have tickets and I just received the, the gate entry time and uh, my mobile ticket. So I'm yeah. just and then they call in even more confused. Um, and then again, that all falls back to our sales and service. So you can yeah. see it's all connected by us not alleviating those concerns. Marketing is sending that communication. It all circles back. Um, you have fans confused, fans frustrated, right? Which probably leads to lower retention rates. Some of those things we'll talk about, um, you know, we have to be conscious of not only, okay, great. We, you know, we cut down on messages sent and we, we boosted open rates and clicks rate, click, click yeah. rate. we boosted retention. We, we retained people by speaking to them in the way they already expected. And I'll tell you what, it's more important these days when you have companies like Amazon, you're competing against companies like, you know, that, that know you <clears throat> and are recommending next best steps for you. Yeah. It's not enough when we're, we can't even get the first part right where we don't know you or yeah. we do, but we know you three different, three different ways. Or in the case of a football club, we know you probably 20 different ways, right? You have a kid in our juniors program. You, you play as an adult in our rec soccer league. You donate to our foundation. You're a ticket yeah. buyer. You have a mobile app. So if, if I know you 20 different ways, it's not good enough. Again, yeah. Why are you sending me duplicate information? And if, if you, 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 yeah, they also expect you to know them. Yeah. Because yeah. They, they're sharing their part of their life with you. Indeed, like their kid is playing in the junior league and parents are, are involved with the, with, with the team as well. So yeah, I could really understand. And they're getting that. that, they're getting that treatment from fortune 500 yeah. companies. And, and I'm yeah. not here to say that, you know, we're punching at that weight, but we should be expected to hold the bar. Yeah. Um, which is to have a singular view of our fans. Yeah. Yeah. Like, are you also implementing some, some machine learning things like, like the Fortune 500 companies are to kind of leverage that information? It's not per se duplicate uh, related, but uh, just very curious. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, we have different, a lot of different ways. Um, one of which being uh, we have an AI bot who can actually, uh, and obviously QR codes during the pandemic was a new, I think yeah, new thing. <laughs> yeah, it's now back on the scene. Yeah, um, with QR codes and our kind of AI chatbots, we're able to quickly screen out and understand either who you are, but what you want and what your intentions are, or what your interests are, or even just a perception of of what you're looking to do. Um, so that cuts down on a lot of different things, right? It cuts down on the the facts that our our you know real personnel have to find out, understand, enter. You know, if our AI software is capturing those live, asking those same things that a normal person would ask, and also logging each of those different things for a real person to see, uh, it saves a lot of time and effort. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, um, because that that's what I suppose, that the, the machine learning, when AI learns from the data you have, if that data is not valid, uh, it, it's still a system. It's a robot. It, it just knows what you feed it. Um, so if that's not correct or invalid, then you get worse results. And I can assume that's pretty costly having such AI tools or machine learning tools because I don't think they're cheap. Um, yeah. So then again, <clears throat> we're not talking about the duplication, but it, it brings us back to the same topic again, uh, to kind of clear the data and to have everything, uh, everything how it should be. All right. Um, Next question. I know that you mentioned that the, the BI industry or the sports industry are their competitors. You're competing against each other. Um, but at the same time, the teams behind it, like the business intelligence teams, um, you mentioned that you're pretty close in terms of how, um, how you work together and, and how you conversate with each other. Like what similarity, if any, is there between the sports and entertainment industries in terms of data quality challenges and solutions? Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the gap is closing um, and, and very quickly. I, you know, the, the owners of sports teams have deep, deep, deep wallets and, and many of them own other companies, right? They, they started elsewhere. So, you know, I'll take it back to, to the case of us, right? Yeah. Our ownership, um, financial services company, very analytically focused, obviously want to compete on the same level. Uh, or at least, you know, perform and, and interact and, and do the right things by your customers in the same yeah. way that they run their other companies. So 
Uh, in terms of you know how it is similar, sports industries, um, you know, yes, they might see you one night a week or a couple nights a week in the case of baseball and basketball. Yeah. Um, but we have to be able to be able to work with you every single day, right? You know, there's people every single day who are getting on our mobile app, or there are people every single day, you know, ch checking our website, or every single day, you know, just looking. And that's uh, ahead of the next game or in review of the last. And so that's no different than how you get on Facebook. That's no different than how you get on Twitter. We have to be able to be able to monitor your consumption and then be able to recommend your next best steps. Again, yeah. it goes back to this idea of, that's just the expectation now. It's not a, if you're not doing it, then it's hard to believe that you might be in business in the next, you know, five, 10, 25 years, if you're not doing right by your customers, because they are right. Every single yeah. thing they do is tracked, is logged, is loaded. Um, and yes, there are more privacy rules in place, uh, especially here in the U S. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, data quality, um, and the things fans are are leaving behind those those cookies the the data trails they're leaving we have to be able to use them in the right way we have to do right by them and we have to be able to um make sure we are going to keep it secure for our own good and for our own purposes yeah uh, that's, that's for any organization it's not it's not sports and entertainment yes our pro we can get we can get by with maybe you know like i mentioned before quality we could get by with doing that but you would never get by with that uh, in a different industry. It's just, yeah. it wasn't. so, <clears throat> you know, clubs like us and uh, some of the people we, we look up to in, in other uh, leagues around the U S and uh, globally, you know, that's just the things we're holding ourselves accountable to these days. It's, it's not good enough to just, you know, say we're a sports club and yeah. uh, sorry for that second email or sorry for the confusion. You know, we need to, to minimize those, those, uh, those things. Yeah, it's not like the, the old days where people just go to the game and then they talk about it for weeks and then another game comes up. No, you have to keep the, keep them engaged every week via every touch point there actually possibly is without coming off as you don't know them because, yeah, that's not really good for the business. Yeah. So, yeah, that brings us to the topic, um, why us? I mean, um, you know, you, I know you mentioned some of the things, but maybe you could shed some light on... Um, um, things you've seen improve since the implementation. Uh, yeah, like impro yeah. improvement in reporting or improvement in marketing uh, actions or, or that sort of stuff. Absolutely. So, you know, just in terms of some quick KPIs, um, I think some of this you'll be able to find in, uh, in some policy materials soon. But, you know, two of the ones that I really, I really have enjoyed, you know, telling other on other conferences and other platforms you know, Plotty and, and some other uh, integrations we have allowed us to really cut down um, our time, right? Our time from the first time you interact with them to the, the time you close them or the time you wrap up that case Yeah. From, from 40 days to 14. So you're talking about a month and a half to now two weeks of time. And we really want to get that down to 10 days to seven days. You know, it's not realistic to say in the single digits, but, you know, we want to be able to save our reps time so they can pursue new business, new opportunities. Um, and so Plotsy allowed us to really hone in on our fans um, and allowed us to really understand them uniquely and then obviously cut down that time. On the other yeah. side, the metric that our marketing team is very happy with sharing is, you know, 250 to 300% on our click rate and open rate. So our engagement on our marketing, our email marketing, our website, it has drastically improved. And it's because Again, we're, we're sending you the right messaging, which is driving your interest, which is making you click, taking you on a journey you never thought you'd go on before. Yeah. Uh, and obviously we have kind of, we cast wide nets to be able to capture you if you might fall off that journey. <clears throat> but our, our, it's two and three X. I mean, you can't really compete with that um, yeah. when you're talking about, and we have goals to even make it, make it higher and, and really set the, set the standard for, for our league and, and others. Um, but lastly, and, and you guys didn't pay me to say this, but, you know, it's been a pleasure working with each of you, um, you know, very, very personable. Um, I think every single, there've been times when I might've come in hot and you guys level-headed and cool-headed had an answer or had it on the roadmap for uh, a next release. So we've been very happy to know that, you know, before our concerns are even voiced, that you have a plan, um, that it's either, 
you know, it was my misperception of, of the product and, and some of the features within it or else, Hey, we already caught that, you know, our, our team of developers, uh, I'm sure Ruben and his team, what they were doing is, Oh, sorry, we already got that. It's going to come out, you know, at the yeah. end of next month or, or next quarter. So it's been a, you know, that you don't get that kind of treatment with other vendors, uh, other, other partners where, you know, they put that in their backlog and they say, you know, we'll reach out when we can, when we can reconsider that in the case yeah. of, of this product, it's always been, you guys have been ahead of us and just have been really, uh, really great to work with. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the, for the nice words. It's, I, I feel the same way. Sometimes it's frustrating because I'm like, Ruben, this, uh, <laughs> this isn't working or this should be fixed. He's like, yeah, it's on the roadmap. I'm like, come on, man, <laughs> give me some credits. I thought I, I fixed it, but they're always one step ahead. So that's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's time for the Q and A. We're almost, yeah, it's two minutes left. So if, if there are more questions, we can always hang on. Um, feel free to send some questions in the, the chat um, or in the Q&A uh, panel and Ruben will help me with monitoring these. So uh, let's see what we can get. Yeah, so um, there's one question that came in. If you guys have any questions for Hard or for Ogi or for me, then feel free to um, send in the questions via the Q&A uh, control panel. Um, th there is one question for um, for heart. Um, so uh, Eddie is curious. He uh, asks, uh, what was the time that it took you to implement the Plaudi tools for Chicago Fire, uh, Fire uh, to improve the single customer view? Uh, and can you tell us something about your overall experience? I know you, that you just told us a little bit about that, but maybe you can uh, scoop in a little bit about the time that it took to implement the Plaudi tools. Definitely, yeah. So. Um, we went on the free trial. So I, think, I believe it was a 14 day trial um, that they allowed us to go on. Look, we were hesitant at first. This was new to us, right? We had trusted, again, other partners to just do it on our behalf. This, this tool is meant to be a collaboration. It's meant to be self-run by you. You define the logic, you define the rules, and then you enact them. Um, and that's something that I value. Uh, I know other companies would love to say, you know, hey, do this for us. Uh, we value doing that internally and really understanding our own business, right, first. So it did take, we did the 14 day trial. And I'll tell you what, in those two weeks, we knew after five days, this was the right product. Um, we obviously just maximized the time of the trial just to iron out a few more things before we went live. Um, and then we timed it up um, during our off season to allow us, so this past winter, um, well, I guess not this past, it's now six months old, but um, you know, six to nine months ago, that's when we really honed in on the full rollout of everything um, and, and allowed ourselves a good run up to our season. Um, so it really took no, little to no time. I would say, you know, under a month for sure to, for the entire, uh, for, you know, at least the basics to be implemented. Um, you'll be able to know right away in the free trial that, um, you know, what it can do for you and, and whether, uh, again, it, it works within your, your platform and the way you're set up. Cool. Yeah. That's quick. Under a month. Yeah. And especially if you want to get things in, in your own hands, that's indeed, uh, yeah, we're the right guys for that. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Jonathan says, is there a way to automate some things? We have a quite large database. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, especially what um, Hart mentioned as well. Um, they have around, I think, one, one million records. And I think there are even clubs, which I think you're one of the, the bigger clubs, but there might be even bigger ones who have even more records. Uh, but the goal there was to indeed automate um, those merges. So whenever records come in via any integration, so it doesn't matter what it is, um, as soon as it gets into Salesforce, uh, you could trigger some, um, some rules to say, okay, we'll auto-merge or auto-convert those records um, um, immediately. Uh, but you can also make certain filters or predefined filters to say, okay, we'll only auto-merge records that have a value over of X or Y or Z or some very custom stuff. And that's all possible with, uh, with Apex, Apex, um, Apex coding. Uh, but for next month, um, uh, I hope next month, <laughs> um, we're gonna release some more um, extensive merge rules um, in the UI. So you don't have to build that um, customization your own via Apex, uh, but you could do quite a lot of things with, um, with in-app uh, functionality. Um, so that's going to be huge. And then you can also use the Apex or customization to kind of dial down on, uh, on, on what you really want to accomplish. 
So yeah, there's definitely a way to automate things. Is there anything else? What's I got a, uh, oh, yeah. a new uh, question coming in here from uh, Jurian. Um, did you consider the Salesforce tools and why weren't they sufficient for your use case? Uh, it's a, I guess it's a question for, uh, for Hart. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned it earlier on in the presentation. You know, Salesforce, uh, they do have duplicate identification, but it's very simplistic. Um, I think, you know, in the case of our organization, a lot of different, you know, via API or via our warehouse or via marketing cloud, there's different, uh, the expectation, Salesforce, I'm assuming, had thought there was just one connection, right, into their instance. Um, and therefore all the duplicate management is taking effect in the warehouse. That is occurring for us, but because our reps have the ability to create potentially a duplicate record and we can, we now block those things. Um, but yes, you know, again, the Salesforce is just looking kind of sim simply across fields, the same field across multiple records and yeah. not, and not like down and across to like, like records. So again, I give the example of like, you know, marketing email, and ticketing email or uh, phone, home phone number and cell phone number, right? Even if we know their cell phone is and their home phone are the same and they were just entered into two different contacts differently, we still need to be able to look across and uh, Salesforce is not able to do that. Um, you're able to make a combined field and then do that with, uh, with Cloudsy's tools. Um, and then uh, you didn't say, uh, Ogi, in, in talking about the automation, but the, uh, the, the DC local tool where it allows you to just pull out those duplicates out of your Salesforce instance, you know, quickly do that in a, you know, outside of the environment and then let you load them back in and do that. Um, it, it's, it expedites the process as well. So if you do have a large organization, it, it really cuts down on the time. Yeah, cool. Well, we have a very nice question as well over here from Nick. Um, and I think this is a kind of a combined question for both maybe you and me, Hart. He's asking in the sports space, we have had many conversations around customer data platforms or CDPs. Um, vendors including Microsoft, Core, Stellar, Algo, um, would Plauti consider itself as a CDP as well, or is there a slight distinction? Um, and I think we, we mentioned this in the, in the call before, um, that you are actually going away from these customer data platforms, right? Yeah. So like, uh, what, what was it, what you called? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yes. In the right place. I'll, I'll hold it. I'll hold from saying who we're <laughs> on, but, um, yeah. It is fit into the same CDP space. Um, yeah. But the difference, um, you know, we, we were on one of those and, you know, it's meant to assist kind of smaller BI groups or organizations or sports teams who don't have um, that internal resource, that internal group. So uh, just recently, you know, we've since moved off of that CDP platform and managed that ourselves entirely within our, um, our Snowflake data warehouse and also within our Salesforce instance. So we have, Again, two and three different people within that are, you know, I would classify them as experts, but admins in those two different tools that almost do what yeah. CDP platforms are doing for you. So CDP, MDM, really synonymous here, but, um, you know, again, it was just an expense that we thought we could build, we could bring internally and then scale yeah. ourselves. Yeah, and to kind of add on to that question, Nick, um, what, I, what I'm visualizing is um, a CDP, that CDP platform sits before the data gets sent to Salesforce. And it might be right. as it might be like going both ways, but um, if it is the data from that CDP flows into Salesforce, right before Salesforce, there's duplicate checks. So it deduplicates those records that come in or validates it as well, the record validation. And if there's data coming back to that CDP, then it's already valid or deduped. So yeah. I, I wouldn't say, Plauti is a CDP, but it's more of a more of the the the, the cleaning lady <laughs> of, of the CDP. Like it's make sure that that information is is correct. Yep. Now maybe cleaning lady is not that good of an analogy, but uh, it's like important. It. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if there were no people were cleaning, then we would be back in the Middle Ages. Um, I think yeah. I said thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Nick. Um, I think that's it. We're all a little bit over time, but um, that's always good. Um, yeah, so next steps for the audience who's listening, uh, would love to hear from you. So you can schedule a call with one of our, one of our experts. 
is plowtycom slash demo. Um, you can start a trial. As Hart mentioned, it's a 10 day trial, uh, but we can make it 14 if you want. Um, you can install duplicate check, install record validation from a Salesforce app exchange, um, and then you can get going with it. And um, yeah, find us on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So yeah, thanks Hart for, uh, for the talk. Appreciate it a lot. I think uh, the compliments are, uh, as soon as I go on Slack, I'll see that, that we're pretty happy that you said these things about us. So uh, thanks for that. And thanks the audience as well for, uh, for tuning in today. Uh, and hopefully to the next one or onto a book on a one-on-one -on -one call, one of our experts or me, um, so we can see if we could help you out with, um, with cleaning the data uh, before the, the rush uh, starts with all the stadiums are getting full again. All right, yeah. Thanks, Hart. Thanks, Ruben. You got it. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, talk soon. Ready. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.